So we're gonna start with baseline assessment. You need to know where you are before you can have a good idea of where you're going. That's the first reason or the first function of doing baseline assessment. Yesterday, I described the IEP as a map. It's a plan for going from here to there. Part of the IEP, or the big focus of the, of the IEP is coming up with the goals, where you're going, but you can't really do that in a meaningful way if you don't know where you are. And so it's often important to have a good baseline assessment as the basis for coming up with good goals. Otherwise, you risk uh, wasting time and maybe sometimes working on things that the student can already do or overestimating where baseline is and therefore setting unrealistic goals, which is one of the limitations of um, IEPs identified yesterday in the Rubel et al. study that I mentioned. The second reason you need uh, baseline information is for performance monitoring. So if I have some data on where the student is and at the first few weeks of September, and then we start having some data that we'll talk about this afternoon on the acquisition of skills and the implementation of the IEP, we can compare our progress data to baseline, and then we don't have to offer anecdotes about how's the student doing, I think he's doing better, it's, it's emerging. We're actually able to put it on a graph. Right? Imagine that, I will share a bunch of graphs with you. You'll see a bunch in your handout later on. Um, so that just allows for a tremendous amount of accountability, which is something that everyone recognizes has been lacking historically in IEPs. So it's an ongoing limitation, even though the Ministry of Education has always said that there needs to be objective data. So how do you get this baseline assessment? Here is your rule of thumb. It's the RIOT Act. So you can review records, interview people, put eyes on it yourself, or test it directly. And I'll run you through each of these and give you some examples. So reviewing is understanding a student's needs can be informed by reading various records, right? Their file records, um, there may be some diagnostic reports, psychoeducational assessments, um, and when a student's coming in to say kindergarten or grade one, early elementary, it's usually helpful to look at those things, or if a student is coming in midstream, it's helpful to do some reviewing of the records, or when the student transitions to the next setting, Outside of that, there's probably limited utility in reviewing records. It can only get you so far. It has some value, but in terms of the four options here, I would say that it has probably the most limited utility, uh, but never none. I'm often in circumstances going into new settings where I do ask to have a look at the records, and it just gives me a quick kind of snapshot of what to expect before I go on to more direct observation. The next way to get information is go talk to people, right? Getting information from people can be very helpful, um, even though we're not necessarily always the best informants. And there's some research that shows this, that even talking to parents about how their child is doing, uh, the parents are telling the truth. They are the most altruistically motivated people you can imagine, but there's nuances in, I'm asking a question to dig for this, and the parent might be interpreting it differently and saying something else, um, or it's either over or estimating what the child may do. And again, th there is, this is not lying, no one is trying to mislead anybody, it's just that it's hard to sometimes get the information you're looking for, no matter how willing the interviewee, whether that's parent or staff or anybody else, which is why we'll get to observing, because when you go and observe it, then you really get a good sense of what's going on. So, but I don't want to underestimate the value of talking to the parents. There was one of the quotes yesterday, who's, um, or one of the resources that said, parents know their child well, and I scoffed at that, Parents are the experts on their child, and so their, their input, your input, right, half of you in the audience or more parents, is critical. People should be talking to you to know what your child can or can't do in terms of their baseline. We might also talk to staff who've worked with the student before. Again, EAs, we don't want to discount the role, the critical role of EAs um, or disrespect their role. They know these students so well, they spend so much time, so I get a lot of good interview information from EAs because they're in the trenches every day, along with the classroom teacher, right? Some teachers are more involved um, than others, depending on the grade and uh, abilities of the student, et cetera. But all of those are options available to us. Um, you might talk to other service providers, whether it is speech pathologists, behavior analysts, occupational therapists, et cetera. And don't forget about the student. Increasingly, I've been in circumstances where we're talking about things with the adults and we realize we could just go ask the student. The student has their own voice. Right? We wanna respect the advocacy of the individual wherever possible. So feel free to, don't forget about talking to the student. So as we move through the Riot Act, even if you look at this slide here, review records, interview, these are 
indirect methods of gathering information. We're not actually seeing the phenomenon of interest. We're just gathering information from documents or talking to people. And that is kind of the, the, the least rigorous way of getting information. As we move down here, it's almost, it is literally funnel shaped you see on your, on your uh, slide here. As you move down, it becomes more rigorous in terms of the information that you're getting. So as we move from interviewing to observing, now we're getting more rigorous because we're seeing exactly what's going on. If I wanna know how a student is doing around their um, self-determination skills, their social skills, their communication skills, just go look and assess. So this is getting eyes on. Um, there's a few examples here. I might go and, if, if, for example, if it's, uh, how are they doing in math? I might go in and watch what they're doing in math, maybe look back a few pages. That would be a bit of that kind of work product or portfolio check to see how they've been doing. If I'm looking at their printing, I might look at what they're currently doing in terms of their printing and look back over the last few pages that they've done in this linear progression of printing skill development to inform um, my opinion of where are they right now. And the whole point of this is the leaping off point for functional goals. The other thing you can do is go and test it. And that can be kind of informal testing or formal testing. You can go and do a probe. Like if you're wondering how does the student do with something and you talk to people and you're not really sure based on talking to people what it looks like and maybe it's not possible or practical to go and see it, just jump in there and get the child to do something, right? Do this math, do this um, language arts or this art activity or this fine motor activity or an inter in, in interaction with a peer and just see what it looks like. That would be more of a direct probe. More than just observation where you're observing what happens in the natural flow of behavior, you're getting in there and kind of manipulating a bit, which is more structured. You can do criterion reference tests and criterion reference tests are tests that compare the child to themselves over time, right? Then they're sensitive to change. Curriculum-based measurement can be very helpful. Um, for example, if, I, if we're wondering about a grade two student's literacy and people's opinion are, seems to be pretty close to where everyone else is. Well, that's an opinion, that's an interview, a bit of information, baseline information, but you can get a bit more specific by asking the grade two teacher to just make up like a 10, 15, 20 question uh, probe, right? Make up a worksheet that you would expect all of your students to do reasonably well on give it to the whole class and see how they do. That's kind of a class baseline, the child's class baseline, and then give it to our student and see how they do. And then we'll be able to make a more kind of quantitative comparison between how they do on the same worksheet that, there's, that their same age peers uh, were working on. So that's an example of curriculum-based measurement. Then you've also got norm reference or standardized testing, which could be in some cases um, a referral to a school psychologist or private psychologist to do an academic assessment, to know um, at that level of specificity, how is the student doing relative to their chronological age? And so those are kind of the regular tests. More often than not, you can just go in and do something informally. I was in a school not that long ago, and we were wondering, uh, the student was finishing one level of a math program and moving on. We were wondering how well he was really getting it. So we just went on to the publisher's website for the program that he was following, printed out a placement test, went and had him do the placement test. It was really kind of a probe. Didn't have him do the whole thing. He did about the first of four pages, and then we stopped him and said, okay, we, we have an understanding of where we're at and what we need to work on, right? So it's really, that's the point of all of this, is having a clear understanding of where you're at so that you can move on to setting goals and what you need to work on. Here's, a, here's an applied example. So here's the fictional Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison is a student with autism in grade nine. And the situation is that we're all sitting around his IEP meeting in the fall, discussing his social skills needs and trying to generate good IEP goals to improve these skills. So he's one of these students that I described yesterday who you would describe as very high functioning. He's fully integrated in his classes. So when you think about those four long-term goal areas that we'll get to today, um, he has social needs because he has autism. He no longer has communication needs. His, cu his communication tests in the normal range, so we eliminate that, that area. He also needs supports around some independence. Um, and in terms of academics, he's actually doing the same academic work as pretty much all of his peers. So his long-term goals are really gonna be around social skills and self-determination. That's what we're talking about at this IEP meeting. And it, this is high school. So the best social opportunity in high school it's actually not in class, it's the time between classes. It's the hallway transitions where kids are being social in an unstructured environment. And it's the high school cafeteria at lunch, which is the single most social time. 
Unfortunately, that's also when the education assistants are least likely to be with him. So we're wondering, like, what are the social skills that he needs to learn that are going to benefit him? And somebody in the meeting says, well, he needs to talk to his peers during lunch, right? Because all the kids are talking. Someone else says, well, I saw him last spring during lunch, and he did seem to be sitting nicely with a group of boys. I could not hear what they were saying, but he seemed to be participating. Right? So does that really help us? There's a bit of interview going on here. People are sharing their opinions. Um, it's outdated information. It's from last spring. Things change a lot from last spring. So the question is, do we have enough information to make a good goal here? This is kind of an illustrative example of why you need to engage in identification of present level. So what should we do in this circumstance? Can we go to file records? Well, the reality is there are no records that talk about his social engagements in the cafeteria at lunchtime. Can we interview people? You could. You could go talk to the other kids. You could go talk to him. The problem is that the reality with Thomas Edison is if you ask him, how are things going at lunchtime? Do you, do you need any help? Do you have any goals that we could help you with? He would say, no, everything's great. I talk to my friends. But the truth is a little bit deeper than that. You, is there a test for this? There's no social skills test for talking to friends at, at the cafeteria at lunch. So you're really left with a bit of interviewing, but best is to go observe. And so that's what we did. We stopped having this conversation. And we realized we can't make a good goal right now because we don't know what he's doing. So I went undercover. And I wandered through the cafeteria, trying to look, you know, casual and that I wasn't spying and eavesdropping in people, which is difficult in the high school cafeteria. The kids, the kids look at you, like, who's the narc who's wandering around? And I try to get close to here, and they, they kind of clam up when the stranger comes by. But I was able to wander around the cafeteria enough that they stopped paying attention to me. And then I noticed that he was sitting with his friends. He was talking with his friends. He was sharing things on his phone like all the other kids were doing. The other kids were laughing at what he was saying. But when I got close enough to overhear a few snippets, what was going on was he lacked the social skills to engage in the way that all of the other kids were. He was very much motivated to do so. He loved his peers' attention. What he was doing was essentially um, engaging in an endless stream of offensive comments, making fun of the things that his friends liked, making uh, socially inappropriate um, comments that he knew would trigger his friends because that got attention and that got laughs. And to him, that was good enough. But when you watched it, you realized these weren't the best quality social initiations. There's a bit of a rough edge to it. And there was a bit of annoyance from the peers and a little bit of kind of egging him on to see what else he would say. And if you were just watching from the periphery of the cafeteria, it would look pretty good from a distance. So we actually had to get in there and get the real sense of what's going on. And now we could come up with a meaningful goal around how to be more successful with your friends at lunch in ways that aren't just pushing their buttons, because that will only go so far, right? So assessing present level, let's engage in some activity here. I'm going to guide you through some of this. So your student has been sequentially working through a leveled math program for two years. Uh, performance data is collected for each lesson in the sequence. There's data collected on every math lesson every day. And now you need to determine what the goal or objective should be for this coming year. How do you assess present level? And there's some giveaways here. This is a, uh, a leveled math program. The student is working through it in a sequential fashion. Right? They start at page one, and they move to the end, and they move on to the next level, page one to the end. So really, um, there's no test that you need to do here. You can go and do a review of records. You can just go and look at what page is he at. I can go and look back over time to see, well, and I can calculate, on average, how much of each program is he getting through per term, semester, per year and know where he's at now, and know what we can reasonably expect in terms of progress over the next short term, say to the next reporting period. If you were really curious, you could also do a bit more testing and digging into his mathematics if you're interested. Right? But this would be a simple way to figure out where are we in math so that we can come up with a good goal. Number two, you're receiving a new grade three student to your school, and you need to establish goals and objectives for her oral reading fluency. So oral reading fluency is measurable. It's the number of words per minute. And this is a new student coming into the school. So you don't know the school. Um, could you review records? Absolutely, but I doubt her records coming in are necessarily going to um, report on her oral reading fluency. Or if it includes that, it's going to be old, right? And you're probably going to need to update that. You could talk to people. How, you could ask, how is her reading? And people would say, well, pretty good. She's a pretty good reader. But that doesn't quantify the words per minute that you're looking for for oral reading fluency. You could observe her, but that's really uh, kind of a poor measure. It's better to just test this. Do something like a Dibbles assessment or um, some, some, something similar to that. Different districts have different ways of uh, assessing their literacy that they've adopted within their, within their district. 
So this would require a formal test that doesn't take a lot of time. Right? I could accomplish this probably in less than five minutes, and I can quantify the words correct per minute at grade level, and then know if we even have a problem, never mind what the next goal should be. That's the other reason for doing baseline assessment. Sometimes you do this assessment and you're like, oh, we don't have a problem. Great, we can allocate our time and resources to other goals. Number three, you need to establish meaningful social skills objectives around initiating with peers at recess. So this is recess, so this is going to be elementary school. Kids are out on the playground. And we're particularly interested in how the student initiates, which means going up and asking to play or asking others to join him or her in their play. Right? That would be a social initiation at, research, at, at, at recess. So could you look in the student's records? You could, but you're probably not going to find what you're looking for. Could you interview people? Well, you could interview the people who tend to be outside at recess and say, you know, how's Johnny doing with social initiations? And what will probably happen is the people who are out there at recess are meant to really be the police and make sure there aren't problems. And if there aren't problems, then the student's not on the radar. So they probably don't um, know the nuanced information about his success with social initiations. They just know whether or not he's getting into trouble at recess. So that's probably going to have limited utility. There's no particular test for recess, so just go outside and follow him around and you'll be able to figure that out. Um, I always think of one of the first kids I ever worked with. This is the student I mentioned yesterday morning, um, one of the kids who changed my life because I started working with him when I thought I wanted to be a school psychologist and I saw how quickly he learned and I changed my career path. And I was his education assistant in kindergarten in grade one. And in kindergarten, he was outside um, trying to play with the other kids. And we were actually sitting in his IEP meeting. I was the education assistant at that point. And we were trying to think about what, uh, what were important social skills at recess time. And everybody was thinking, well, he needs to learn to socially initiate. Um, and we were just guessing in the dark because we didn't really know what was going on at recess. So I went out after that meeting and I just watched him. And he was a Star Wars fan. He didn't have a whole lot of language, but he really liked Star Wars. And he would walk up to random kids on the playground and he'd look at them. He'd just walk up to them and look at them and they would stop and look at him. And he would hold his hands up and go, <laughs> which if you're a Star Wars fan, you know is opening your lightsaber and initiating a lightsaber battle. And most kids kind of looked at him and didn't get that and kind of thought that that was strange and moved on. And so he would just go on to the next student. And I watched during recess and he would just go from student to student around the playground initiating lightsaber battles and very few students would ever reciprocate that. So the problem wasn't initiation. He was initiating like crazy. The problem was the topography of initiation. We needed to teach him an effective way to initiate. So that little bit of baseline observation helped us come up with a much more meaningful goal for him. Number four, um, you need to establish functional objectives around the grade one student's toileting skills, right? If the students in grade one are not toileted, that should be at the top of the IEP priority heap. That's a self-determination goal and a dignity goal. And this is one where you can just talk to people because people know what's going on with toilet training. They know whether that student is in pull-ups um, or underwear or having accidents. And so you don't need to go to the records, right? You could do a bit of observation, but really interview is going to be probably quite effective in this case. So now we know what the current status of toilet training is. We can move forward with the business of getting the student toilet trained. Number five, you need to establish a meaningful objective for a grade two student's receptive listener picture vocabulary. Well, this is very specific. So if you look in file records, you're not gonna find anything that specific. If you talk to people, you're not gonna get a specific answer. Um, if you observe the students, that's in the natural flow, you won't get the information you're looking for. Here, you're probably left with doing some type of test. Maybe this is where you ask the speech language pathologist to come in and do a formal receptive picture identification test or something like that. Right, so testing would work in this case. Number six, you need to establish a functional objective about the student's independence with her school arrival routine in grade 10. So this is a grade 10 student who has had support for years and that really meant initially that the parents were walking the child in and there'd be a handoff to the education assistant, complete control, but now she's doing really well, she's gaining more independence, she's in grade 10. The parent wants to pull up at the curb and the student gets out and goes into school by herself, finds her way to her locker, puts her stuff away, and then moves to whatever class she needs to be in or where her education assistant will be. We need to know what's the status of this process. Where are we today so that we can finish teaching this or identify that this isn't even a problem? So will this information be in a, a record review? Probably not. 
Can you talk to people about this? Absolutely. You can probably talk to the parent dropping off, talk to the EA and get the present level. You can't, don't, there isn't necessarily a formal test for this. So you're probably going to be good enough with an interview um, or even just doing one quick observation. Right? You just stand outside one day when the student arrives and you observe what go, what's going on. You're able to verify, okay, mom reported this and the EA reported that and I observed the whole thing and it, that it is as described. And here we go. How's our lighting? Are we okay? The sun is coming out in Vancouver, so we're, uh, we're just dealing with some shadows here. Number seven, um, last one, last example here, present level, and then we'll move on. You need to establish a socially valid goal around taking conversational turns for a grade seven boy with autism. So you've got some leading information here, conversational turns. A conversation is a turn-taking exercise. I say, hi, how are you? And you reply back, and I reply to you, and this goes on until it reaches its natural death, and this may be a long conversation, or it might be a very short conversation. So basically, we need to know how many turns should this, is the student engaging in in order to know how should we push this objective, or is this an objective that actually we don't need to address? The conversational turns aren't a problem. This won't be in your record review. If you talk to people, they probably haven't been paying attention to the nuances in terms of the number of conversational turns. And there's no test for this. So you're probably just going to go and sit down with the student and watch them talk to a friend. Or in terms of testing, I spoke too soon, a probe would be you engage in that conversation or you coach a peer to engage in that conversation, which is a bit of a probe observation to see what does this look like? Is this okay or do we need a goal around this, right? So this is, these are steps that you should be taking that we should all be taking early in the school year, these are things that the EA, we can really put into their lap to probe some of these things if it's not a direct test, uh, that they will be able to be sensitive to and gather this information. Because the more of this you have coming into the IEP, the more productive the initial IEP meeting can be. If there are circumstances where you don't have it, I'm getting ahead of myself, so do this before the IEP so that you can use this information to guide the IEP meeting. And if you don't have that information, then pause that and say, after this meeting, we're gonna go and do a check, right? We're gonna do one of those, one of the riot tactics to figure out where is your student at, where is your child at, so that we can move forward in a logical way. 